today I will be speaking about the practice of qualitative research as it applies to testing. A little bit about me, I currently work for Bitly as the lead QA engineer. Prior to my work with Bitly, I worked for several other startups, including Rent the Runway, Work Market, Nomi, and Target Spot, which is now a part of Radionomy. During those uh, experiences, I worked with both uh, manually testing uh, mobile tools, manually testing web-based tools, uh, doing automated scripts using BDD frameworks like Cucumber and Python for regression tests. Prior to my days testing software, I taught music in public schools for about 10 years. Uh, my degree is in music education with a focus on assessment, which is just yet another fancy word for testing. My research on assessment involved checking, assessing, evaluating, and paying attention to the heretofore unattended to actions of the teacher in the classroom and how their performances actually worked with the students to assess their learning and give them feedback that made their learning better. And this is what I noticed and wrote in uh, about my dissertation. Much of my own research uses qualitative strategies and because of the use of that research and the exciting results that I got during that, I decided that I'd like to share some of these with you today in hopes that they may be of use to you during your testing practice. So when I changed careers from teacher to tester, I noticed that the ways I interacted with the software felt pretty intuitive to me. My first day ever of testing was, let, I was let loose with the instructions, put the problems in a spreadsheet. What? So I was like, what do I put in the spreadsheet? And the CTO said, just put the problem and where you found it. I had no wireframes. I didn't know what the product did. I had nothing. They were just like, test it. So that day I sat down and uh, I found 76 bugs in the application in four hours, including a showstopper JavaScript bug that was present in both the web app as well as uh, the native mobile apps. And that required four days of development work to fix before I could go back to work again. So I was totally engrossed by testing. I loved it. I was like, this is the best four hours of my life, which a lot of people would not think that about that situation. But I really, really enjoyed it. Now, having been dropped into testing cold with literally no concept of how people discussed aspects of software development, the software life cycle, uh, I just started to ask questions. My natural researcher sort of kicked in. And I was like, well, who's using this? and how would they use it in a real world situation? And I was testing uh, pharmaceutical software. And so in my head, I had this really energetic pharma rep and she was like, hi, so we're selling this new drug. And I had this really annoyed doctor in my mind who was just like, yeah, 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 yeah. And so I clicked four times and it crashed. And I was like, ooh. So then I tried it on the computer and everywhere else. So by imagining this scenario, the situation of the user and questioning who is doing what with the software, I was able to dig in pretty deep and pretty quickly on something that I literally had no instruction with which to follow. So I never realized that, you know, as I, as I decided to get jobs doing software testing and switch careers, I never realized there was anything kind of unique in my approach to testing. Uh, my approaches were uh, qualitative, performative, sometimes even musical, which I'll explain uh, later. And yet I returned what were consistently called good catches by the development teams I worked with. And I have been truly, truly blessed to work with some of the most amazing development teams. They've been 
great, and I've learned so many things, and they've let me ask so many questions, which is really great. So I continued along a similarly qualitative line of questioning when I began needing to build tools for UI regressions. Uh, for example, when I was hired for my first lead QA job, I used uh, qualitative interviewing techniques to interview all of the key stakeholders in the entire company. So this meant interviewing uh, the head of sales, it meant interviewing the head of product, meant interviewing the head of hardware installation, development, every single person, sales, um, customer support, anybody who did something in the company, I interviewed them. And using the qualitative skills, which I will share with you, I learned about how the company software problems occurred not only from the perspective of the code base, which is where a lot of people will look when they're looking for problems, but from the perspectives and lived experiences of the stakeholders. Because I followed a strange path to software testing, many people who saw my resume wondered how I learned to even test and why I wanted to test, and I couldn't give them an answer. Then one of my CEOs asked a question that made it click. He said, how did you get from being a music teacher to quality assurance? And immediately my answer was, well, they're actually a lot more similar than you think. And I went on to explain what seemed to me really obvious parallels, as I am also a professional violinist and violist. So I thought, well, you know, you look at software, you don't look at the whole thing. You learn to play a Mozart concerto. You don't play the whole thing at once. You play the first note. You play the first measure. You group it. You approach it. You think about what parts are the trickiest. And kind of the same approach when looking at software. You don't always test the sign-in page and ignore the you know, part that handles credit cards, even though that part can cause a lot more issues. So in a similar vein, music and breaking it up and tearing it apart to make sure that each little tiny piece works and then putting it back together, software testing to me in my head looked a lot like that. So it was a little bit of a different experience for me. So areas that initially seemed disparate, like philosophy and testing, music and testing, or teaching and testing, started to play together in my head. And the more I played with these ideas, the more it seemed to me that the qualitative research and software testing were eerily similar in method. Of course, as with any practice that one chooses, there are assumptions that one accepts when choosing an approach to testing, whatever that approach may be. Philosophers such as Lyotard, along with Foucault, resist accepting one meta-narrative or single truth about anything in society. They have a question everything mentality, does it really, is it so? And the, this lens has helped me to view testing as um, searching for truths rather than an answer, and for different ideas based upon the problem at hand and the lenses through which we have to look at the problem. And those lenses can be given to us by ourselves, by the product developers, or by the stakeholders, such as business and the end user. So I hope that by sharing some of the key approaches of qualitative research as a tool for testing with you today can provide you some different perspectives on how you talk about your work and how you do your work. So qualitative research is generally considered to be exploratory in nature, often used to understand the context of a situation or a subset of situations. The results of qualitative research are intended to provide deep insight into an experience, as opposed to making generalizations or assumptions about a subject or a experience. Robert Stake, a prolific expert in qualitative research with more than 50 years of work in his field and its applications, notes that the more we study human affairs, the more we expect that things will work differently in different situations. 
So at this point, I suspect that some of you are wondering what human affairs has to do with software testing. And when I first considered how to articulate the relationships between qualitative research and testing, it occurred to me that humans and software are not so different from one another. Yes, I, I understand the limitations, but please allow me to elaborate. Creating and testing a software product are human endeavors. The software did not create itself. Humans created the software. And we build the automations, even if we're using automated tests, humans are building those automations to test the software. Code that builds up the software and sometimes the automations is developed and written by humans. The software is developed for human use and generally has characteristics that users will hopefully find intuitive if it is intended for external use by an end user. Software products, particularly web and mobile applications, are often fluid, having new code committed on a regular basis, sometimes multiple times a day, changing the application and requiring the constant attention of developers, DevOps, and testers. Software, oddly, seems more alive in this context to me than many other uh, fields. As you can tell, my test background is in software applications, and uh, most of my examples will be from this domain. So having made a reasonable case for considering qualitative questioning as a tool for software testing, I will now turn my attention once again toward Robert Stake. Stake breaks down the qualitative research process into smaller sections, identifying the key components that make research qualitative. It is here that assumptions are identified and accepted if one desires to use a qualitative research methodologies in their whole. Besides these introductory methodologies, there are hundreds of books, research articles, and even handbooks devoted to this subject. For today's purposes, I am going to stick with Robert Stake's methods as an introduction to the field of qualitative research as they are a good foundation for working with qualitative research methodologies and test and can allow for further research if desired. Stake's first characteristic of qualitative study is that it is interpretive with multiple meanings and is subject to interpretation by the researcher as the researcher has her own personal history that becomes part of that interpretation. An example of this in test may be that of differing user types in a web application. A tester can use this concept of multiple interpretation or lenses to envision how various users might interact with a system. For example, one company I worked for had an application that allowed for three different user types to sign in, an administrative, a contract, and an employer type. While many aspects of the application were entirely different for each user, some of those aspects were shared in the software. And as a tester, I needed to explore this application, particularly the shared portions, with each user in mind to make sure that each user had a positive experience with this piece of software. And also, I needed to make sure that the parts of the software that were uh, shared among each of the different users actually displayed what was expected. So if an admin user went in and was looking at the dashboard, which was a shared dashboard that only pulled different uh, data from a different database, I needed to make sure it was pulling the right data from the right database, that all of those things kind of uh, lined up. So in order to do that, I needed to ask myself, what would one expect? If I'm an administrator and I have uh, three contract users that I am looking after and two employee users I'm looking after, what do I expect to see? So these are just, they seem like basic questions, but they inform the path of test and exploration to uh, help ensure that a good user experience can be uh, identified and if there are problems can be fixed. Additionally, there were uh, certain monetary issues with each different user, and so I had to make sure 
that each user's uh, payments could go through in the proper way with, of course, test credit cards, because real ones would not have been good. Um, so making sure that those go through in the proper way, as expected, through each user's lens. And rather than just saying, oh, well, okay, it's, you know, an employee user, I'd really try to put my hat on and say, what would an employee expect of this product right now? What would anger them? What would make them so happy if they could see it? What features might they want to see? What features would annoy them? And I would try to do that for each level of user that I was testing so I could gain some information back through my thinking and through my testing cycle. The second characteristic of qualitative research is that it is experimental, empirical, and field-oriented. The research emphasizes observations and does not intervene or arrange to get data. So in test, this may mean that understanding what qualitative researchers might call the problem space of the application is critical in being able to avoid faulty assumptions about the application, while at the same time asking questions that are relevant to a specific area under test. For example, working on an application that is internal and is used in an ad-serving space would require different questions than working on a consumer-facing website, and both of these are different than testing systems that are signed to track inventory or financial interactions for a bank. So before beginning to even test an application, testers might be wise to gain an understanding of the problem space in which they are working. So in order to uh, do this, I have used my experience with qualitative research and interviewing to learn about the problem spaces at hand. So when I was testing um, ad delivery, I learned about all the, I learned about the different companies that performed um, audio ad delivery, that performed ad delivery on the web. I learned about the different technologies that they used so I could better understand uh, what performant meant, not only within our application, but outside of our application. Because maybe it's performant for us, but it was kind of bad for everybody else in comparison. And as a tester, I want, I want personally to be able to have that knowledge to say, okay, we're performant, the, you know, we, we can release, and maybe, you know, be able to go to the product person and say, look, I checked out product XYZ, we're performing at this level, they're performing at this level. What are your thoughts? Is it QA's job or tester's job to do that? I don't necessarily know, uh, to be perfectly honest, but I know that when I test, I get information other people do not have. I can figure out how performant something is. I can figure out how much load something can take. And so if I share that information along with the research I've done, then that may be able to help the product become a little bit stronger. The third characteristic of qualitative research is that it is situational, meaning it is oriented to objects and activities within a unique set of contexts. It does not aim to be reductive, it does not aim to make direct comparisons to be something else in the product. So the point to really pay attention to is the aspect of things being situational. As testers, we must understand the activities that the software performs. These activities can include pulling information from a database and displaying it on a website, using information from multiple databases to inform an algorithm that displays information for consumer use. Questions that we can reasonably ask in the context could be, in what situations will this application be used? What information or data is important to test in the use of this application? And what activities would one use this software for that might be against design expectations, but could be reasonably done 
based upon how it was designed. In other words, understanding the context doesn't just mean understanding what it was meant to do, but understanding what it's capable of doing, even if it is unintended. And in that manner, malicious, that it's more of a security kind of thing, but understanding if and how malicious actions can be uh, taken with the software, asking those questions and understanding the context around which the software is actually being used can be very informative and may allow developers who might not have thought of, oh wait, we're designing it to do this thing, but it does this other thing that could blow up our whole system. So that might be helpful information. And these are helpful questions to ask as we're testing because we're not just testing for positive. We're also testing for uh, negative, what, what don't we want, what kinds of things are happening that are undesirable. And what are the unintended consequences of doing certain things? The fourth characteristic of qualitative research is that it is personalistic and empathic, working to understand individual perceptions. The issues that occur emerge from the research and from the people involved. This fourth characteristic involves more of a philosophical mindset rather than a set of activities or prescriptions or do's or don'ts. For example, as a tester, when I initially perform my interviews with the stakeholders in my company, I avoid leading questions and instead try to ask very general questions that will allow the stakeholder to share with me what they feel are major issues, as well as their expectations for the product and how these expectations are or are not being met. So here's an example. Instead of asking the head of the sales team, so, uh, you know, what issues are you having with development? What's going on? That sets up kind of a, that's inviting a negative response, just by the way I asked the question, because in, I'm asking them to look for things that are wrong. Instead of, can, can you tell me about your workflow? Uh, what's your typical work day like? And how do you interact with each team? So in that sense, I'm inviting everything into this space. And qualitative interviewing, qualitative questioning, it's very important to invite all of that uh, feedback and all of that lived experience of the other person that you are interviewing into the space so that they may be fairly represented. Sometimes, though, both people and software grow quiet. Silence can be louder than words as researcher Lisa, Lisa Maze points out. So when you're conducting a qualitative interview to try to understand the needs of the customer service team, maybe they stop talking and they just don't give you any information. Now, the question that we have to ask as testers is what does that silence mean? What does it indicate? Maybe it indicates that they are having a political problem. Maybe it indicates a problem with another team. Maybe it indicates a problem with me or with my boss or another problem that they're not comfortable talking about. But letting that silence go completely, now we, I wouldn't say, let's badger them. <laughs> I wouldn't say, no, what do you, why are you silent? Why aren't you talking? Okay, I'm trying to get this interview done, right? We don't want to do that. <laughs> However, backing away from it and taking the time as, as testers, as thinkers, as researchers to, to wonder and to maybe uh, use that as a way to approach somebody else and say, I noticed that customer service was really quiet yesterday. Is something going on in customer service? Maybe they're having a bad day. It's, it's hard to know 
and it's even harder to guess or to make something up. So using the research skills to learn as much as possible so that way that when we approach our tests, we can dig deep and we can do testing that matters to our constituents and to our stakeholders. Now, software. How is software silent? In ways, it's all silent. I see computers going. I'm looking right now at a piece of software in the back of the room. Uh, I, see, you know, I see phones on desks, tablets, and it's all quiet. Humming along, working pretty well, and that's great. However, sometimes our software goes silent when we're testing. Sometimes it just doesn't do anything. And we're expecting it to do something. So it hangs up. We get a 404 error. We don't know why. We get uh, you know, some kind of running an automated script, and the script just stops. Can't find this element. Don't know why. So when our software goes quiet, we need to know who to find to help us get those answers. Uh, for me, it's my DevOps team because they can dig into the logs really fast and say, oh yeah, this is down and this is why. It's like, thank you. Um, for other times, it's because somebody put too much load on the machine when she was testing it and broke it. Like, legitimately, I broke it. And uh, that was my fault. But knowing why, asking the question, like, why is this happening right now? And who can help me? So paying attention to silence is something that, uh, that is done by qualitative researchers, but it's not often talked about in other fields. Now, products of qualitative research are generally checked by researchers, and researchers ask questions and refer to literature and experience to confirm or disconfirm their findings. In testing, this is a good place to check our work and make sure that our assumptions do not cloud our testing. Now, I've worked uh, as the sole tester in almost every job that I've had, so checking has required me to go outside, find help in development, product, design, or another department to make sure that what I what I see and what I think I see is what is actually there, so to speak. Some, in some cases, people might be working in a group of two, five, or even ten testers in a large company, perhaps more, and then that can become a great group to lean on and say, hey, this is what I'm seeing. Is this what I'm supposed to be seeing? What do you think about what I've found and what I'm seeing. So this is also helpful to make sure that if you're seeing something really, really strange, re very strange, that you go to stakeholders. And an example I have, um, which everybody thought was no big deal and turned out to be a two and a half week work stopper. And if I hadn't pushed, it would have probably been another week, week and a half before it was, it was decided that this was an issue. So I worked at a company where we were having um, pieces of our hardware was reporting information that seemed really, really off. And at first it seemed like the data variation which we were seeing on the software side shouldn't be a problem. So. And even middle management said, hmm, you know, it's not that big a deal, you know, and I was doing, uh, you know, I had screenshots and all different kinds of data because I was just, something felt wrong. Like in my intuition, it felt like this isn't, this isn't right. And so I kind of just kept an eye on it. And then about two days later, we had a meeting with all the upper level tech team and because I was a lead, I was in that meeting, and uh, the CEO said, this client of ours has been reporting this data, da 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 has anybody seen anything? And I was like, hi, <laughs> yeah, so this is what I saw, and this is what it was reporting, and I have screenshots, and I have video recordings, 
down goes my hand. He was like, okay, we have to redo this. So we spent, the dev team spent about two and a half weeks rebuilding product underneath while other product was happening. Um, and this was something that if I had just dismissed and said, oh, okay, it doesn't matter, and gotten rid of all my data without double checking with multiple people, it could have been a huge cost because it was a big client. So the idea of double checking one's work, even, you know, even though it's not fifth grade math, still matters, still matters. Now, the ideas of qualitative research methods have basically and finally uh, led to me realizing that drawing together all of the experiences that we have as testers and as people are the things that make us stronger testers. I am not a strong tester because I because of any one thing that I did. I'm a strong tester because I played violin, because I did qualitative research, because I learned Linux, because I like to play computer games, because I like puzzles. Um, so all these external, all these big things that pull together create me as a tester. And I think that what qualitative research invites us to do aside from asking questions, is gives us the opportunity to experience ourselves as full, whole people within our jobs and use those full, whole experiences that we have and that we have built over our past histories and inside of ourselves to make our practice better. And it is my belief that if we can grab onto that which makes us whole and use qualitative questioning techniques to examine not only the software but ourselves, that we will find ourselves as better and stronger testers with a lot more to offer because we have so much more to offer of ourselves than the word tester. Thank you. on the microphone. Um, Michael is officially managing the stack, so make sure he can read your cards. I got 145. Anybody else? 80? 80? Start there. All right. Well, here I can do that. Uh, so my, f my question is, um, some of the different stakeholder types that you mentioned there may not have often been approached for their input on this sort of stuff before, what sort of reactions did you get from them and what sort of feedback did you get afterwards? Um, I've, I've performed that interview process at two companies where I was the lead and um, I, the stakeholders were so excited. I really, I actually did not expect them to be so excited. I expected them to be like, dude, another meeting? Are you kidding me right now? But they were really excited to tell me about what they did. They were excited that their voice was being heard in terms of quality. They, they, I mean, they were very, very excited. And they, even most of them ended with, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm so excited you're here. I can't wait to see what you do. I'm like, oh God. But, um, but overall, very, very excited, very curious about why I wanted to talk to them, um, very happy to share their role in the company with me. And again, I should clarify, most of my, well, all of my work really has been in startups, which do tend to have a different um, cultural build, I guess, than like larger banks or, uh, you know, advertising firms and that sort of a thing. So it may work differently, again, depending on context. Okay, there. Oh. So following up to that, positive experiences there, have you ever had any where they've been like, why the fuck do you want to talk to me? What, 
what are you doing here? <laughs> um, no, I haven't. But again, it you know, smaller. There are smaller startups that I've done it with, and I'm sure you know. I mean, I bet if I try to add a larger company, they might be like, dude, seriously, fuck out. <laughs> so. Okay, there was a new thread number eighty. Where are you? Ah, oh, thank you. Regarding finding issues that require days of rework, uh, what ways have you found to avoid that? Maybe get the feedback sooner, and maybe you could fix it while it's still being developed? Yeah, um, that unfortunate situation happened um, as I was a consultant. So they didn't have a regular QA at that time, and they'd already built it. So um, yeah, normally the places I work, all but one or two had uh, pretty decent agile methodologies and either had QA in the mix early on or the ones where I was the first person, I said, I need to be in like when it's being designed. This is when I need to be involved because I need to be able to look at wireframes and say, hey, wait, what's that consumer experience going to be like? You know, is, are, is, is the consumer going to be upset? What kind of a change is it? So normally that hasn't been my experience. It was just really unfortunate that it was my first testing experience and it was uh, just a consulting experience. But yeah, you're totally right. That's very avoidable. <laughs> okay, uh, 177 and 73. Hi, I'm also a musician, so I appreciate your description of the correlation between music. I've been trying to say that for years, and you did it perfectly, so yeah, it's thank you. Um, and my question is, have you uh, turned this interviewing practice back kind of on yourself? Because I find the work that I'm doing right now, there's, there's a danger for it to get stale. It's, there's parts of it that are very repetitive. Mm -hmm. So have you tried turning this like on yourself? I um, think that might work. What are your... What do you think? In terms of questioning my work or in terms of saying like, okay, Jessica, da, 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 like. Yeah, like interview yourself about. Because I talk to myself all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I really do. Like, and that's what I'm thinking of. I'm like, wait, I kind of talk to myself all the time. And I, I, informally, I do. I haven't initiated it as a formal practice, although that probably would be very helpful to make note of. Um, typically, as I'm working through a problem, I, you know, I'll have my notebook because I'm very old fashioned that way and I'll write just the questions, I'll sketch out the, uh, I'll sketch, you know, the wireframe, even though I have it in Dropbox, like I could print it too. No, um, you know, I sketch the wireframe and I do that and I do ask myself questions and what is this here and why is this here and this is important to them but dot dot dot. So it's a, it's a very informal process for me but it would be interesting to see what that would look like actually, like kind of as a formal part of the process. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good one. Uh, Green, 73. Hi, I just, um, earlier in your presentation, you mentioned that you worked for Pharma or you were doing software testing for Pharma. Yeah. And <clears throat> I'm curious, uh, is the quality uh, gonna be different from the way that people, <clears throat> the way that people, uh, in your qualitative research, do you tend to get completely different um, viewpoints on that in your startups versus something like pharma? Yeah, um, you, you do. Uh, <laughs> I, I've found that startups, and I don't, I don't know what the reason is, I mean I haven't conducted formal research on any of this, uh, this is all very informal, but I've found that startup companies seem to be more invested in the quality of their product being tight, whether or not it happens, that's a different story, but they voice a desire for that to be there. Whereas the bigger companies I've worked for, it's just like, does it work? Get it out the door. I mean, does it work? And then when, you know, you bust it 76 times, and it doesn't work. But, <laughs> but yeah, it, I, it's definitely, there's kind of an attitude shift that I've noticed even in bigger companies um, my, where I've, you know, I have friends who are developers who work in bigger companies, huge companies that have no QA. And like companies you would not believe, I will not name names, but companies that you think, oh yeah, have you, no. 
not even, not even a little. So yeah, I think there's definitely a different attitude about what they put out the door, how fast they're going, what their development life cycle is like. And I think it's individual to each company, but again, I don't have enough um, research, scientific data to base that off of, just due to lack of talking to enough people. Have you got anybody? No. Okay, then I got 118. Hi, um, I'm really appreciative of this. Um, it, I, the, it has given me um, a structure to put um, some ways that I question. Um, and uh, I'm, one thing I'm curious about is you'd said that you have um, interviewed, you, you do the, these interviews at the beginning of the project. I'm a little, I'm curious about the time you've spent, you spend on it, um, whether, and the time you spend when you're not interviewing to uh, review the information, just to get a sense of that. And I'm also curious to know if it becomes an ongoing conversation with some of these stakeholders or, or has it mostly been for you a uh, sort of single event per project or, you know, that kind of thing? Um, in a, in a really nice way, it actually is usually the first time, like, besides, oh, hey, and that's the person in charge of customer success, so and so. It becomes a really nice way for me to have a relationship with that person. Then when they have an issue, they come to me. Or, like, when they have a big issue and, they, you know, they're feeling like maybe they need somebody to come to, they'll come right to me, we'll talk about it, and I can kind of get it to the right person, or I can go in, I can triage it, you know, we can figure out how to get it where it needs to be more quickly. Uh, and yeah, over time, it gives me a nice relationship because as new things are being worked on, I can say, oh, hey, Jen, can I hop in a room with you for like 10 minutes and we'll just discuss really quickly what your expectations of this are? So the initial interview it gives me an idea, okay, this is who you are, this is what you do, this is who you report to, how you talk, you know, all of those kinds of things. And then the follow-ups relate as people either need me or as I need something from them. And we have that open dialogue, which I think is probably the most helpful part of that process. Okay, same 137, Fred. same Fred. Uh, so on that same third, after you've done the uh, qualitative research with each individual, do you kind of take that and create it as a lens? Like, let's say you've got some PM, and you're like, hey, well, now I'm wearing my PM lens, and I want to see how that person sees this product. Or, um, so, I mean, do you, do you manage all of those different lenses and kind of keep, how did you track that or keep track of what you've done? How do you organize that workflow? Um, typically, I will put it in either, like, a like a Word document or an Excel document and just kind of keep track of like major, like this is their major project. This is their major investment in the company. And then these are their things that they're really unhappy about. And just, you know, just so I can reference it as something is coming up. As I work at, at, at somewhere, I, I just rem like remember like, you know, who hates and loves what, but I work at small, companies, so that's not, uh, you know, it's not as hard as maybe working at a company with 200 people where, you know, that, that would be, that would be extremely difficult. But, um, you know, right now it's just kind of just basic organization and then remembering um, as, you know, as I'm working with them. And their needs change too. Like if I'm able to help fix like one part of their process through, you know, through doing QA, like sometimes they'll say, you know, nobody ever pays attention to us. I'm like, okay, I'll pay attention to you, you know? And they'll come to me and I'll say, okay, let me do this, let me test it. It takes four minutes of my time, but it's, you know, it's created happiness. And then I can, you know, hit, hit an engineer and say, hey, I found this, you know, weird bug, so-and-so reported it, you know, what, it, what would it look like to fix this? Drop it in the backlog, there it is. You know, so it's like the little things that I find I'm able to kind of triage that way that help make people a little bit happier too. All right, so same thread. thread. No, wait, we had a same thread. Same thread yes. So following on with this, um, having the ongoing discussions and stuff like that, do you, at the end of it, after a successful release or a disastrous release, do you go back and review what you did to see if there's ways that you can 
improve the interviewing process as you go? Um, I have not had a disastrous release, so I can't say that, I can't answer it. I'm very lu I'm lucky, I'm a lucky person, but, but I would, because that's a piece of data. And so I can definitely say I would and figure out, okay, who said what, what was needed, you know, what happened that wasn't, that wasn't talked about, that didn't get addressed, that kind of thing. I mean, there have been bad releases, but not like disastrous ones. Usually for the bad ones, um, there's like a, you know, kind of a pull together and just say, okay, what happened? Well, we forgot to run this set of this, you know, unit tests. Like for companies I've been at where they don't have CI, like they forgot to run a unit test and they just push the code or, you know, random things like that. And then it's like, oh, you know, but uh, in terms of huge, massive explosion, psyched down for, you know, an hour or longer, have not been there yet. <laughs> okay. uh, new thread, number 74. Thanks. Um, so the group I belong to, um, we're going through a lot of change at the moment. Um, and some of my colleagues are maybe not embracing change as enthusiastically as others. Um, they're, they're being embedded in development teams, they're dealing with very demanding stakeholders, and they're having challenges, you know, having those conversations, asking those questions, um, and there's a little bit of confidence issue there as well. Um, I guess, how much is it a, a learned skill, um, setting up these meetings, asking those questions, doing those interviews, and how much is, attitude, personality, whatever you want to describe that, you know, is there, is, there, is there something that I can take back and go, go do this, this will help you build your confidence? Yes. Um, this is definitely 95% learned skill, like 5% personality. You know, because like the bubbliest, nicest person in the world could come in and be like, hey, da, 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 and really negative people who are kind of like resistant to change are going to be like, F you, dude. Like, I don't, you know, so, it, it, you know, but there are ways to ask the questions um, in which people, um, in which people feel that their space is being honored. And I've, I have found in, in my teaching space, actually, not in my software uh, tester space, but in my teaching space, working with, uh, you know, teenagers and kind of trying to do exercises and stuff like this with them. Uh, <laughs> they, asking them kind of what are their shared goals first and trying to get out of them what they have in common has been helpful. And that, you know, just because if we're all striving toward the same goal, you know, A, we all want to have a job at the end of the day, um, you know, Hopefully it's not that simple, but, um, but there's that. But I can, if you want to come up after, um, I can give you the names of some books. Uh, one book that might be helpful is called Learning from Strangers, The Art and Method of Qualitative Interview Studies. And that's by Robert Weiss. And then there are some other there are some other books that might be helpful um, in terms of the language, the specific language you choose to use, um, uh, that have been used in a lot of different kinds of difficult interviewing. So uh, I can, if you want to come up after, I'd be more than happy to share. Okay, uh, new thread number sixty-three. Hi, um, I was wondering, have you ever had the opportunity to interview like? end users or customers of the software you're working on? And if so, has their expectations ever differed than the project team's expectations or your client's expectations? Um, I did work at one company where I had the opportunity to, uh, to interview and they, customers definitely have a different expectation because they don't know how it works. And so once I've, ex once I, ex like, you know, I'll ask them, I'll talk to them. And, and generally, you know, you hear from customers when they're really psyched or when they're really pissed. There is not a middle ground with customers. And so in talking with, you know, the really psyched customers, it's just like, oh, it's so cool, I love it. 
like, yay, great, keep, you know, posting that. But for the customers who are really upset, um, their, the interview with them tends to focus around uh, what, what needs are not being met by this product for you. And at that point, I actually, if they ask a question about how the product works, I, I will answer it. But I, I find that sometimes uh, customer support um, interviews that I've heard, and this is not everywhere, this is, you know, I don't intend this to represent all customer support ever, but sometimes I have heard customer support where somebody will be on, you know, our side, you know, of the phone and say, well, this is how it works. But that doesn't get the information, it doesn't make the customer feel heard or give the, get the information about what their need is. And um, something that I would love to see is if customer um, support, from a QA perspective, is to get more insight on customer need because that allows a different lens through which to test. Like if you test the highest area of customer need, you will have happier customers, less complaints. That's, you know, that's a way to look at it. That's a lens, that's an approach. Not the only approach at all, but it's an approach that could be beneficial if you're a service-oriented product. So I have had the chance to do it, but um, not nowhere near as much as I'd like. Uh, new thread, number 197. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm also very into music. I played piano and then went to French horn, uh, so I agree. Um, I have two questions, but they're similar and it might be the same answer. But what are your favorite questions to ask? And um, what are the questions that get you the most bugs found? Get me the, get me the most what? What questions find the most bugs, help you find the most bugs? Um, I think you're right, you are gonna get the same answer because my favorite questions are the ones that get me the most. Um, asking somebody, what can I help you do with my role? So this is my role at this company. Given that this is my role, how can I help you do your job better? Like that's my favorite one because it forces them to understand my role a little bit. Uh, forces them to understand, you know, I explain, I go and explain it first. Like I'm the QA lead, this is what I do, this is what I've been tasked with doing given all of these things, you know, what, what can I do to improve your job here, your life here? And that allows me just to understand what their needs are and they can express their needs in a way that fits like my capability and they know what they can expect given what I've just told them. They can set like a reasonable expectation of how much time they're actually gonna get. So if there's any, there any other questions that want to be asked, you have cards up so we can get you on the queue. Hold on. And while I'm doing that, so 188. Yes. I just have a question about uh, the context of putting the lens on of different perspectives for the stakeholders. So let's just say there's uh, conflicting needs between the different lenses of like stakeholders. So is there any type of qualitative questions you can ask to kind of find a resolution or maybe a middle ground between the conflicting needs of the stakeholders? Uh, for sure, I think there are a few different ways you could handle it. I think it's a little trickier for QA if the stakeholders are much, much higher up. You know, like if, if like the CEO and CFO have a problem, they can keep their problem. But if it's like, uh, you know, if it's like a design team member who's telling me, no, I want one thing, and this is quality for me, and uh, you know the front end developer is telling me, look, I can't give you this because whatever you know front end reason. Um, I can call a meeting in the middle of the you know just call a quick meeting in the meeting room, and something I might say is, hey, so I've been testing this page, and you know I've I've noticed that you know 
Uh, Joanne, you told me that uh, you were having some issues here, and I, I understand that. And Paul, you said that you were that you couldn't really do this work. So I'm just trying to understand what's going on here because I'm gonna I'm having kind of like a tough time testing and verifying this page because I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing because it seems like work is unfinished and just let them kind of air it out before like trying to be like the, the mom, the conflict re resolution. Um, let them air it out. So that's one way I could see doing it. The other way I could see doing it would be, you know, okay, bring Joanne into the room. Hey, Joanne, I've been testing this page. You know, this is what's up. This looks good. These are some things I have some concerns about, and Paul also has some concerns. What can we do? Then bring Paul in the room. Same thing. So, you know, it depends on who the people are and how, like, irritable they are and how passionate they are about the issue that you're asking them about because you might wind up with like a screaming match, which is no good. <laughs> okay, same thread, 145. So a lot of what you just talked about there sort of would work really well for small organizations all in the same location. How would you try and tailor that to a larger organization across multiple zones, time zones, things like that? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I've actually had to do similar work. Um, in one of the companies I worked for, I managed uh, two uh, offshore testers in Uruguay. And so we had a little bit of a time difference, but also we had issues and I was often the person who uh, people went to because I could articulate our needs in a way that didn't make them angry. So um, I think regardless of like distribution of team or whatnot, uh, it's, it's, it's very important to have clear communication. So somebody on the team who can really clearly communicate to your offshore people or you know, your, your uh, offsite locations, somebody who, you know, like maybe everybody in the, the main office who is involved sits down and says, listen, we have a problem, you know, this is it, hashes out the problem, this is the solution we'd like to see, but we're not sure. And then who can take this to Uruguay? Who can take this to Orlando? Who can take this to China? And who can get, bring us this feedback? And maybe you do it one-on-one -on -one Skype, maybe you do a big group Skype, but having somebody who can clearly communicate and who is very, very good at that with every external team is probably the most important because so much gets lost um, in translation. So much gets lost over like hip chat or anything like that, um, which is why I'm a very verbal, I'll do a five minute meeting before I'll do a hip chat because I feel like a lot gets lost in the typing. So I just think that as long as it's clear and you choose somebody who's really, really, able to articulate the problem and the desired solution that it can, it can be managed. Uh, new thread, number 60. Oh, well, let's do 66 because I'm closer oh, and then we'll okay. go to 60. <laughs> <laughs> right. sure. uh, you talked about becoming the, the voice of these users who don't often have a voice. How often do you become the conduit of a flood of feature requests and what kind of dynamic does that set up with folks that are trying to control the scope of these projects? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question, especially, um, fortunately I haven't had to work in a situation where it's been really, really a flood of feature requests. Um, my first QA job was probably the most uh, often like that, where we would do releases every two or three weeks, but, and I was, the, you know, I was the, like, only, quote, manual QA, and so there were 12 features and all, plus all the bugs, and because it was waterfall style, I didn't see anything until three days before the release, and so it was, like, a huge pain. Um, I think, I think that, and this goes back to just communi like, more back to basic communication even than the qualitative thing, is just being very, very clear and setting boundaries which I think it's really hard for QA to do, not because we can't, but because we don't want to disappoint. 
you know, I mean, from, you know, it's like, no, I'll, I'll do it, I'll get it tested, I'll get it all finished, but truth be told, we only have so much time. And if we don't set boundaries around our time and make people understand, look, our time is important too. The end, like, this is what you've got, this is what I have, and I'm not gonna stay up till midnight every night, two weeks, testing this. So, you know, allow that to bleed into your scope. <laughs> Um, you know, just super setting super strong boundaries. And, and I hate it, but it has to be done. Okay, same thread, number 118. Um, well, I didn't articulate for myself what I was doing. I, I like to do some of these early interviews with stakeholders too. Um, and one of the things that I've found in terms of it addressing actually this whole idea of a flood of requests is that if you're understanding um, their perspective early, like I, I, I work on a CMS. So one of the stakeholders are people who use tools that we give them to build the website. And if we have, you know, some of those early conversations helps, um, has helped the team understand sort of patterns that are useful to them that we can apply um, more generally, you know. Um, and so there's actually less um, rework later or, you know, there's a pattern that people are happy with, um, so I've seen that work and so it, it, it didn't turn into, I want this and I want this and I want this, you know, it was just, it was a conversation so we understood their perspective better and kind of just did a better job of designing towards that. And number 60. Um, quick question, why do you choose Robert Stakes methodology and um, do you have any alternatives and positives and negatives from his writings? Um, I chose Stakes methodology because it's, it's basic and it's easy to start with. Like it's pretty much your, I'm in master's degree, like when I was in my master's degree and I was starting with qualitative research, they're like, here's Robert Stake. And I wanted to start with something that would be digestible to people who had not, um, you know, who had not necessarily uh, performed qualitative research or anything like that. So that was really uh, a choice that I made, and that's why. Um, Kareen Glesney, uh, I really enjoy her work becoming qualitative researchers. She happens to, um, she takes more of a kind of philosophical turn that I like in her work um, and that it's um, a little more reflexive. Like Stake's work is not reflexive, it's straight up qualitative research. But Glesney's work is a little more reflexive where it's like you're questioning but then you're bouncing back to yourself. And so I do happen to like that about it. Um, and then Lisa Maze, I mentioned and brought up because I found her work um, interesting in terms of the, the concept of silence. We don't examine silence, but she did. And she did it with this group of teachers and the things that she found out when she did were incredible. And so I, you know, I selected that work uh, specifically to share um, with this audience for that, you know, for that reason. Um, and trying to think of other works that, um, trying to think of other works that I've used for qualitative research that have been um, particularly helpful. Uh, the yin, no, not, well, hmm. Yeah, I'm not gonna like go through this, <laughs> sorry, I'm not gonna waste your time being like, yeah, meh. But uh, if you wanna like, like if you wanna grab my information after, I can like uh, go through my actual bookshelf and uh, give you some recommenda recommendations off of that because that's probably better than me sitting here like wasting time. <laughs> okay, do we have anyone else in the room? I do have one Twitter question. Okay, we've kind of hit on this a little bit, so <laughs> if it's redundant, let me know. Um, how will you tailor this approach for distributed teams on a large scale? That's a good question. Um, so I guess it would depend on the distributed teams meaning do, do, do the distributive teams ha each have a QA or 
a QA team, like, uh, you know, I mean, so for me, it would depend. So in, if it was just a single QA, I would do, you know, I would go in and do the same work. I would do it once and then pull back and do it as needed to perform my job. But then, um, if, I, if it were a distributed team with a QA on each team and I were the QA lead, I would, you know, pull back, I would do some training and I would send out the QAs to just practice this with their own teams so that way that they could, uh, you know, start to hone this skill and learn this skill because the questioning, questioning is what we do often. We were asking, why isn't this working? Why is, why is this doing this? Why is it flaking out? Why am I getting this number? Why is the page turned black all of a sudden? Like, um, you know, so I think that that would help them. And if I were the lead, that's how I would approach it. Okay, we had one and more. And on 145, thread. on same thread. <laughs> so with this one, I think uh, another situation here, similar to one that we, our company's faced, shut me down if I say anything I shouldn't do, um, is we, up until October last year, we didn't have any dev and test team based in the US. Okay. We had our customer service, our sales reps, those sort of people based in the US, seeing the customers, all the rest of our teams back in Wellington, New Zealand. How would you go about arranging this sort of stuff in that scenario where the distribution is that there is no QA over here, there is no dev over here, how do you go about arranging the communication is the questioning like that? Um, the closest I came to was my team in Uruguay, which was, there were a few developers and there were two QAs that were shared devs as well. So they did, they spent half their time testing and then half their time doing development work for the product. Um, and in that situation, it, be, it was really, really hard just to even, like I had to break everything down so small so I was understood. And so there was definitely, for me, there was a translation problem uh, because I'm not good enough, I wasn't good enough at Spanish to conduct business in, you know, in Spanish, which they got a good laugh out of and I got some training out of, you know, they, they helped me out. But um, I, I would say if I were in that situation, breaking everything down as small as you can and watching out for communication issues like idioms in questions uh, or, or, or any kind of cultural specific references because those are things that I found tend to get lost. They got lost and I would have to spend 15 more minutes typing, explaining what I meant because I used an idiom or because, you know, and it's nobody's fault. It's just the nature of communication across, you know, broad distances and different cultures. So. I would say break it down really small and watch out for uh, communication issues like idioms, cultural specific, and then um, hopefully you can get to a point where you're able to communicate what you need and other people on your team too, reminding them, hey, listen, you know, we really need to be as clear as possible and this is what clear means because sometimes they think they're being clear and they're not. But I used to think, I I'm totally clear. All right, we've got about 10 minutes left. Any more questions? All right, great. Thank you, Jessica, and thank everyone in the room. Thank you.